Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and this is an exciting video today because we're going to be delving into the heart of the heart of Data Lake House. Of course, the heart of the Data Lake House is Delta Lake, but the heart of Delta Lake is the Delta file logs. So we're going to dig in and deep dive on those and really understand how they work because that's going to make you a better data engineer. But before I jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon where you get direct access to me, specialized content, and more. Now in this video, it's gonna be a little different in that I will not be executing all the code as we go. The reason is that when you're using Delta files, things move around a lot. Behind the scenes, the Delta service is renaming files, copying things and shifting all around. And the file names are kind of weird because they kind of look like they use GUIDs in the name. So it's difficult. I'd have to be really piecing things together to make sense of things. So I won't be doing that, but rest assured, all the output is in my notebook as we go. And as usual, I'll put links in here that can be really useful to you, including this one that has a nice description about what's going on in Delta Logs and how they work. This is gonna be a deeper dive than that, but it's reinforced by the concepts explained in that video. The little blog here, like in the beginning, the idea behind this little introduction is that Delta files are not completely new. They're built on the idea of Parquet files. In fact, they're actually built on the physical implementation of Parquet files, but Parquet files had some limitations. They're not meant to be edited. They're meant to be sort of fixed blocks of, of data. That's a problem, right? You cannot insert into them. You cannot delete, nor can you change anything in them. The way they're set up is kind of interesting because our parquet file is really a folder. And then under it are all the individual parquet files. And the system automatically will pick up all the parquet files that are in the folder and treat them all as one. So that means the one thing you can do with the parquet files is append. So it's sort of like inserting but it's not specific, it's just appending more data. So it's a little bit different. Delta files, as we'll see, give us complete insert, update, and delete functionality. Before you can go mucking with the underlying inner workings of Delta files, you need to make this setting, which is to set the Spark data bricks Delta format check enabled equal false. That's so that when you try to read the parquet files under the covers, you don't get interrupted by Databricks saying, oh, you can't do that, that kind of thing. So that's what that will do. It allows us to kind of look at the underpinning. Now, the other thing I'm going to do here is just to show you that we should have uploaded three files here. They're in the link in the description. Follow that. That'll get you the files and the code for this. But there's going to be three files. There will be our original source of data for our master file, which is dim sales territory. Then we'll have two transaction files, dim sales territory transaction one and dim sales territory transaction two. These are all CSV files. First thing we want to do is take that dim sales territory. Now these should be uploaded. So you want to go to the data side here, follow the menu and upload the files in there. That's how we're going to get them into the location. And just in case you're not comfortable with how do you upload files into Databricks, I will put a link in the description to a video, which is a little more than you need, but it's one I did on my full Databricks series where it has you initially loading all of the database files that were part of that video series. So what we're going to be doing here is using Spark read format CSV. We're going to say option header equal true, and then option info schema equal true. This means that in the first row of data in the CSV file, it will have the column names and we use those as the column names in the table. We'll use in first schema, and that will say that as we're reading in the file, Databricks will automatically determine what the proper data types are for the columns coming in. And then finally, we're gonna be loading in our CSV file. Be aware that this dbfs colon forward slash thing, that format changes depending on what command you're using to read the Databricks file system. So this is the correct format when we're doing a Spark read. Now, all that's going to be returned to our data frame SPDF underscore sales territory. S stands for Spark, P stands for Python, and D for data frame. I like to keep track of what is a locals data frame and what is a Spark data frame, uh, and that's how I do it. So we ran that already, and you can see here it gave us our data frame. Great. Next, we want to save the data frame. So I'm going to take the data frame we just created. I'm going to say write. I want to make this rerunnable, so I'll say mode overwrite. So if it's already there, it'll just write right over it. I'm going to write this out first time I want to show you what a parquet file looks like. So I'm going to save it to a parquet file and notice under file store, I'm going to be creating a folder called parquet data and then the name of the file and that ran. And you can see now we'll take a look at what actually is in there, dim sales territory. And when I look, I can see some flags that parquet uses to say, yes, it was written. It was committed. 
it started and ended on this date time in a format we cannot really make sense of. And then here is the real payload. This is our Parquet file. That's all there is to it. I want to show you that because there's a difference between Delta and Parquet. What is it? Let's take a look at the Delta file way of doing things. Here, we're going to take the same data frame because it's still there. And we're going to say write mode overwrite. But this time, the format is Delta. And we're going to do the same thing, save it. And here, we're going to do the file listing as we did before. But here, we're looking at the Delta data. We're going to put it under the Delta data folder, dim sales territory. And you notice, we don't have all the uh, files we had for success, check, et cetera, in this case. We do have our Parquet file, right? So it's still a Parquet file. But then we have this interesting folder called underscore delta underscore log. What's that about? We're going to talk about that a lot. That's the topic of this video. What is in there? What's it doing? I will say that is the key to delta files over Parquet files. It all goes on there. But there's a service on top that's using the delta log to provide all the magic that happens that makes you think, wow, I'm using a relational table. Let's take a look here. We're going to be using the file system ls for list files as before and want to see what's in the delta log. You can see there's a CRC extension file. And that's really just like a check digit. When delta tables are being manipulated, it always creates a CRC as a way to validate that things were created correctly. So it's really a check digit. We don't need to worry about those. This is our log file. So we have this 00000.json. That's a log file, and it's keeping track of all the things that have happening. And guess what? We just created a delta file, so we need a log to start logging what you're doing to it. We're going to see more of that now. Now, before I get into too much, I'm going to be doing a lot of displaying of files, so I want to make some utility functions to make this easier. So I'm going to import OS and import JSON, and then I'm going to create a function, show log file. And of course, you're going to be passing the path to the file and the log file name. What's going on here? I just want to have a utility that makes it easy to display log files. And even though they're JSON files, there are actually multiple JSON dictionaries in there that you have to break out to, to make sense of it. And it's not that easy to do. So this little function makes it easier for us to parse through them. And here, we're going to set up a log path. And this is where all the log files for this are going to be is dim sales territory underscore delta underscore log. And we're going to take a look at the first log file here. This is what created our file. So we're going to be calling our utility function and passing in the path and the file name. Now, interestingly, the first thing we see is commit info. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. And you really don't need to worry about all these things as a rule. But you can see it's doing a write. You can see the mode is overwrite. So it knows about that. It's keeping track of the fact that our first transaction against our Delta file was to create the Delta file. You can see it says also number of output rows, 11, and how many output bytes, even the engine and version and things. And it has this thing called a protocol. Now, you typically only see that when you're creating the file. But what it tells us is what's the protocol being used to create this file initially? Protocol can be important later on because it can change, right? Versions and updates can happen to the protocol engine, and you may want to be able to swap it out, and you need to know, like, okay, what was this originally created in? You could see there's multiple dictionaries here. Here we have the metadata, the ID. It tells us everything coming in. It tells us the provider is Parquet, so we know this is actually being serviced as a Parquet file. We can see the schema string, and it's got this struct, and it's telling you what's in here, so it's giving us the schema of our file. And even things like, do we have partition columns? Apparently not, configuration settings, and even the creation time. The really interesting part, though, is here. Log file block four. It just happens to be block four here. We can see that it says add, and then it has a path. What does that mean, Brian? What are we doing there? Add path. I don't get it. What it's doing is it's creating a parquet file, and it's going to add it to the log. So it's saying, I'm creating a brand new parquet file. That's holding your data and I'm adding it. Now, in and of itself, in Parquet, you don't have this, but what this does is when Databricks or Spark wants to piece together what belongs to this file, it's going to look to the log and say, oh, I see that I should have this, this file. What we're going to see over time as we get into the log file is that the log files become a sort of file manifest. As I mentioned, a Parquet file is just a folder, and it can have many individual Parquet files within it. Delta does a little trick, though. It stores different versions of the Parquet file that it should materialize to. How does it do this? 
Well, what it does is it uses the log files to provide a sort of file manifest, what files belong to a given version, all right? It's really a little like a source code control system because it's really versioning all the time. So in our initial version, it will look and say, oh, I see that in this particular version, version zero, we have this file being added. So that's what's gonna make up that particular version. And Delta knows how to piece all that together for you, but the log files are what it does to accomplish that. So we can also see things like the size, modify date time, change, all this kind of stuff. What I also find interesting is it has statistical information like min and max values of your columns. It has insertion and all kinds of other information. The most important thing to me though, is really this whole file thing, because that's where it's adding files and you'll see it removes files, creates new files. It's gonna be doing a lot of work around those parquet files and manipulating them to simulate a SQL Server-like type table. So now we wanna just define in a variable where the data files are stored. You can see here it's going into a file store, Delta table, dim sales territory. Finally, another function, another function. Yes, we need functions to make this easier. Otherwise I'm gonna have a lot of code everywhere and it's gonna be very confusing. What I wanna do with this function is be able to display a parquet file. So you're in the parquet folder. I wanna be able to pick off different files and show them so we can easily view them and see what's going on there. So first we're gonna pass in the path to where the file is and then the file name. As you've seen, parquet file names are kind of weird. They're very unintuitive because they've got these kind of GUIDs in the middle. So we'll just pass them in, and then this function is gonna take it and display it for us. We'll bring it into a data frame and then just display it back. So let's take a look again and see what is in our Delta file folder. And we can see here, and again, it's just the Delta log folder and then the parquet file itself. So you might say to me, Brian, how do I display the history? How do I know what's happened to this file over time? I don't wanna have to go querying those log files. No, you don't. Fortunately, we have some commands to make that easier for us. And one of them is describe history. So describe history will go through those log files for you and give you a more intuitive look at what's been happening. We can see here, we're looking at doing a describe history against our Delta file. You can see it here. And it's not a lot here to look at, except I think when you get here, you can see it was a write. You can see it's an overwrite, right, right here. And you can see in the operation metrics, that one file was added and you can see how many rows and output bytes. So that's pretty useful. Of course, all we did was one thing. We just created our file. So that's, that's our starting point. So we learned a few things from this video. We learned that Delta files are not that different from Parquet files. In fact, you can really say that Delta files encapsulate Parquet files. But by doing so, they add some functionality, which is they'll make these Delta files act as if they're SQL tables. The way they do that is by using a combination of the Delta logs we've seen before. And I call it Delta logs because it's actually, as we'll see, a set of different JSON files and even Parquet files when it starts to want to sort of consolidate the logs. So it uses those, but there is intelligence going on too, right? One, there has to be intelligence to maintain those logs, but there also has to be intelligence to sort of assemble the different versions of the table. So if you've heard of time travel, time travel just means that you can go back and get different versions. Every time transactions are applied to your file, you can just go back and say, yeah, but I want the previous version, just like you could say in source code control. So as I mentioned, it's very similar to that. It's all this magic is happening, really kind of hiding from you, which is good, right? In the service, so you don't have to worry about all this stuff. But once you say, I'm using a Delta file, all of it's getting taken care of for you. And it's kind of just magical, which is how I like things. I don't like to be bothered with the details. So that wraps up this video. I'm going to be digging into it more in a future video. We'll apply real transactions against the file and see how that gets processed by the logs themselves and what we see in the parquet files. How does all this really work? So this was a good starting point. Hope you liked it. Please like, share, subscribe. Until next time, I'm Pullen Foyer. We're all in this together. Thank you.